Hello, guys. This is Dick Thompson. I was the uh, one zero of RT Virginia and RT Michigan. And I just want to wish uh, all of the Armor 3 SOG Prairie Fire players a Merry Christmas and really appreciate you taking the time and interest uh, in our unit's history. Uh, also, a special thanks to the Team Savage developers. I know you've worked um, long and hard behind the scenes to make this game come out. And as someone who has run a lot of actual SOG missions, I can tell you the game is good. It's realistic. It will get your attention and uh, proud to be associated with it. And the other thing that you might not be aware of is uh, this game and the people behind it uh, are making possible uh, a way of increasing veteran stress resilience uh, in 2022, where they'll, where they'll be making available the stress resilience questionnaire that allows you to identify where you currently are and, and the seven best practices uh, to help you build your stress resilience. So that'll be coming out uh, and available for you in January. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, I would um, recommend that during the holiday season, we uh, raise a glass to our veteran friends and their families. And all of you take care, stay safe, and uh, I thank you for what you're doing. I'm uh, Master Sergeant Jim Shorten, uh, Jim Jones Shorten, and uh, I was the team leader for RT Delaware. And I did a strap hang on several other teams uh, when they were shorter men, because so many men got killed in SOG. Uh, I did a, a strap hang as a team leader for RT Illinois too, for a bright light mission. Uh, I served in the Navy, the Army and the Air Force. Uh, and uh, I just want to take this time to, to thank everybody in Armor 3 SOG training, uh, uh, a, a SOG Prairie Fire uh, and the, uh, the Team Savage developers for their wonderful work behind the scenes and uh, also the, the players and everybody who got involved with it. And I want to wish you a very warm and a very Merry Christmas and a happy holiday. And I just want to thank you for taking the interest in learning about SOG and all those crazy guys that actually did the missions. I would like to uh, welcome and, and uh, you know, wish a Merry Christmas to the ARMA family, actually. Uh, you know, uh, since we've gotten involved in the project, we have uh, really grown to meet a lot of people all over the world and uh, quite, quite, a uh, few of them, yourself, Sam, some of the other people we've become friends with and some of the people you play in the game and everything. And so, uh, you know, it is kind of like a Arma family. And so I want to wish everybody a uh, Merry Christmas and, uh, you know, Happy Hanukkah, you know, and, and uh, whatever you worship but for the holidays, uh, New Year. Uh, I hope it's uh, the best one ever in each and everyone's lives. I'd like to take this opportunity to wish all of you Arma 3 SOG Prairie Fire players and your families a wonderful Christmas. Thank you for your support and preserving the memories, legacy, and honoring those who served in MACV SOG and supported MACV SOG. Special thanks to Team Savage developers who have worked diligently and developed this world-class game. So again, I wish you the very best to you and your families. Be safe and God bless. Hello, SOG Prairie Fire players and developers. Greetings from Bohemia Interactive. Well, huge thanks to the Savage Game Design team for their amazing creator DLC and as well to the SOG veterans to help to develop this jewel. Gentlemen, you created something truly special. I absolutely love your work and I'm not alone. It's really great to see how many of you Arma players enjoy this creator DLC. So thanks to you two for playing it. Let me wish you all Merry Christmas from the Arma 3 team and from the whole Bohemia. Stay healthy, enjoy the holidays in the company of your loved ones and I also hope you'll find some time to play Arma. Take care and see you in the come Launam. Oh man, I know it's Christmas time and we're supposed to have a message, but right now I'm busy. I'm in the middle of E&E, 
there's some enemy troops around. I got to stay in the dark. I got to be clandestine. You know how it is, but oh, you know what? I think I'm getting clear. I think it's okay now. Um, I'm just going to try a little experiment here to get into the holiday spirit. Ah, uh, so I can see a little bit of light, but I don't want too much light, but oh, that's better. Ah, uh, okay. Hey, I wanted to just to, to all the Armor fans, supporters, developers, men and women that have enjoyed our game. I just wanted to sign in to say a Merry Christmas to one and all, to thank the developers who have put together this most outstanding video game, probably in video game history. And it's growing in popularity. And we thank all those that put it together and the fans thereof. So I, I think I'm, I'm getting clear. I can move out and have a little bit more of a serious conversation now as we move into the real world. And we can talk about Christmas Day 53 years ago, which is uh, burnt in my memory. And we'll never forget it. 53 years ago, we had a mission on Christmas Day. And um, we were inserted. This is a long story short. We had a six-man recon team from SOG, RT Idaho. It was myself. Lynn Black was the, on the team. Bubba Shore. And then Hep, Sal, and Fook. And we had a mission. We got inserted. They put us in a little hilltop. And we went off of it, made contact, went back to the hilltop. We were in contact with the enemy for a while. They started fires and the fires were coming up the hill towards us. We were trying to literally blow it back with plastic explosives. And then um, at the last second, a King Bee flown by Captain Tuong of the 219th uh, Special Operations Squadron of the 219th South Vietnamese Air Force, literally came in to prop wash, put, pushed back the flames long enough for us to get on a helicopter. We all had singed hair and burnt. Some other guys had some burns. And we jumped on as we left off, as we lifted off from the LZ, the flames overcame the hill that we had been on. We left under heavy enemy fire. And once again, the King Bee saved our bacon, which is why I'm wearing my King Bee hat today uh, we always remember Captain Tuong and his fellow King Bee pilots. So that's our SOG story for this Christmas Day. And again, I want to just thank Armor for getting the SOG story out, spreading it through a game which is meaningful and with due respect to the men who ran Recon and Hatcher Force missions in SOG. And of course, all the aviators. Without them, none of us would be alive today from the gunships to King B pilots to the slicks, 101st, the muskets, just to name a few that, uh, that supported SOG. And of course, the Green Hornets down south, the legendary Green Hornets who still serve our country today with the Air Force. So thank you one and all. I hope everybody has a most Merry Christmas. And keep in mind, we're alive today, thanks to our aviators and the SOG missions were of legend. And we're glad to get our stories out to the rest of the, the rest of the world. And thank you, Arma. I don't remember the Christmases too much, but one of, one of the things I do remember was the Bob Hope shows. And when he used to come around, uh, I went, I attended Bob Hope shows twice. And uh, one was in the Navy, one was in the Army. And uh, it was in Da Nang. And uh, there was like hundreds of people out there, troops and stuff. But yeah, I do remember them, and it was some good times. But obviously, there was no snow or anything, and you know they had the monsoon season, which again sometimes got pretty cold. I do remember, I do remember walking down the streets in uh, Da Nang uh, during the winter time when it got really, really cold. Uh, well, it was winter. It could have been in the middle of summer. I can't remember what. I don't even remember what side the 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 equator it's on. I think it's still north of the equator. But I remember when it got so cold, we'd see people that were homeless, you know, laying dead on the streets that passed away from the cold uh, in the, uh, uh, you know, the uh, environment overnight. Yeah, it was really kind of tra tragic and sad. But, uh, you know, the war went on, even though they had Christmas truths and all this kind of thing, but they still had guys that never got the word and they were still shooting at us and stuff and back and forth. But, uh, yeah, I remember a few of the Christmases. Uh, I remember we had some good meals. That one, that I do remember. You know, for Christmas, that was kind of nice. 
But the, the whole time with me when I was in Vietnam, I, I kind of separated uh, from reality. I, I had a mission to do and I just did my job and I separated myself from reality. I, you know, I knew I was there and I had to do everything I could to stay alive and to help, you know, keep my team members alive and that sort of thing. So I didn't, um, I didn't dwell on the fact that it was Christmas and I wanted to be home with family and stuff like that, uh, which is kind of sad in some, some instances, I guess, but yeah, no, I just, uh, I just did my job. That was it, you know. For me, Christmas in Southeast Asia was on two different occasions, two separate years, two separate locations, and two separate enemies. In 1971, while serving as 1-0 of RT Idaho, President Nixon announced a Christmas ceasefire, 24-hour ceasefire. SOG headquarters uh, all did a preemptive message to us and said, pay no attention to the Christmas ceasefire. It does not apply to us or our units. It's business as usual. And that's exactly what it was. Uh, we continued the missions. I think each team had different experiences. I believe with Idaho, we were on bright light for most of that time. But we had a very special visitor to our camp. Uh, that made Christmas very special that year. And that was the American actress, Martha Ray, known affectionately to us all as Maggie. Maggie wore, wore the rank of Lieutenant Colonel and the insignia as a nurse in the army. And of course she had her green beret. Maggie every year would go out and visit her special forces worldwide. And we were so fortunate in December of 1971 to have her come to CCN. Uh, she's an amazing lady who gave so much of her time. That night, she brought reels of old TV shows for the projectionist to put on the wall, old I Love Lucy shows, I guess Lucille Ball was a friend of hers. Um, and then the drinking began and Maggie outlasted every member of Recon Company in the Recon Club and all of the camp staff. Uh, she had a vodka always, held her liquor better than anyone. And when Recon Company was down and out at the end of the night, she was still standing. An amazing woman who gave so much of herself. And I still recall finally the talks that we had together that night uh, example, her thoughts on Jane Fonda that I will not put in the recording, but I still get a smile when I think of her reply. Um, Maggie rests at the Fort Bragg Cemetery, Fort Bragg, North Carolina. I was fortunate to be in attendance at her funeral. And when my wife and I go back to Fort Bragg, we always go by the cemetery, leave a memento and say a prayer for her. Uh, she is one of those unsung heroes of special forces. Meanwhile, uh, Christmas 1971, outside of our camp at Marble Mountain uh, and in the hills of Da Nang was the great American entertainer, Bob Hope. Bob Hope brought his entire entourage to put on one of his classic Christmas USO shows. It was... Uh, a full house. Uh, it was hard to get tickets, but our talented administrative office counterfeited tickets once we got an original and gave them out to the members of the command. And we all magically had tickets and were able to get into the show. Um, Bob Hope had an amazing group with him, all of the singers and dancers and actresses. Les Brown and his band of renown. Um, it was a special day. Uh, it started under heavy rain clouds with typical high core rain. Um, finally, the music started and Bob Hope walked out on stage. And at that moment, it was magical. The rain stopped, the clouds parted, the sun came out and there was a gigantic rainbow. I was speechless. Everyone was speechless. I think at that time, Bob Hope was speechless. He looked up and said, that's a tough act to follow. 
and uh, it set the stage for a wonderful time. Uh, it was a great show, enjoyed by everybody. At the end, he had Les Brown's band play Silent Night, and he and the entire cast and everyone in the hills sang Silent Night. Um, it was absolutely emotional. Uh, not one dry eye, not one, even with Bob Hope. So we finished up there. You could hear the rockets in the background. And uh, as Bob Hope said, you know, it's great to be back in Rocket City. But we were able to break away from the war for several hours, thanks to Bob Hope. And then thanks to Martha Ray, it was very, very special. Now, my second Christmas in Southeast Asia was in Cambodia where I was assigned to the American Embassy and the Military Equipment Delivery Team. And uh, what we did for Christmas was uh, many of us there in the team and with the embassy got together, got gifts, and one of our rather heavy volunteers volunteered to be Santa. And we put on a small Christmas show, if you would, uh, with gifts for the orphans at the French orphanage La Providence up the river. And these were maybe about 40 off orphans there that the French nuns took care of. We had a wonderful time. Santa, who's one of my friends, gave out all the gifts. And then as he reached into his bag, there was one small Cambodian boy standing there and the bag was empty. You know, most plans never really survive the first shot. In this case, we, our plan, we thought we had enough gifts for everyone in this one Cambodian kids. Maybe he was probably about six years old standing there with tears. So immediate action drill, I picked him up, took him to my Jeep, threw my Uzi next to me and ran down the river with him in my vehicle and went to downtown, the Market Square, Central Market, found a store that was like a toy store and department type little store, uh, took him inside and said, what do you want? Pick out anything in the store. Well, he found himself a transistor radio. Um, I threw in a few bonus gifts and back in the Jeep and back to the orphanage, crisis averted, one little boy was happy. And um, that was our Christmas. Now, Tragically, six days later, actually five in the night, is when the dry season offensive began by the Khmer Rouge, the final assault on the Khmer Republic and to isolate Phnom Penh. And that led to our evacuation in April. But uh, the Christmas was special, the Khmer Rouge didn't spoil it, and the orphans were happy. Um, so to me, that's a special Christmas. Christmas for me is being a Christian, I'm uh, uh, totally into the uh, uh, religious part of the holiday of Jesus' birthday and uh, worship it from that point of view and uh, have many friends who uh, are not. And, uh, you know, that's okay too. Uh, each and every one of us, I think, has to find their own path and and uh, I'm a firm believer that uh, God doesn't need me to uh, preach to everybody. That's not my task. And uh, he can uh, do it quite well in his own way. And he has his own way. So, again, that's uh, part of the Christmas season that uh, uh, is kind of special to me. And I, uh, I kind of personally shy away from the... Uh, uh, commercial trappings of Christmas, and it's it's more of an inner spiritual thing for me. I was uh, there the Christmas of uh, 1967. Uh, we arrived in uh, October, and uh, so I'd been there two months. Um, we had, uh, at that time, I started off as a night unscheduled maintenance crew leader and uh so i would work nights and and get off about midnight and uh then uh pretty much had my days free for me so uh, 
Christmas Day, uh, 1967, for me, was uh, got up and had my breakfast and got dressed and showered and everything. And, and uh, we uh, got word that uh, Bob Hope Show was going to be at Long Bend Post, which was about uh, half, three quarters of a mile from us. And uh, so me and several of my buddies thought, well, you know, this, this is the only chance we'll ever have in our lives to be part of a Bob Hope USO Christmas show. And so we went over to the, to the uh, post bowl where it was happening and uh, joined about uh, 10,000 other GIs from the base and uh, we got entertained by uh, Bob Hope and Anne Margaret and Raquel Welch and all of the stars that he had with him at the time. And uh, the uh, flight crews, uh, they had a very interesting Christmas day. Uh, they were inserting a uh, recon team up in the tri-border area of uh, Cambodia, Laos, and Vietnam. And uh, after they crossed the border uh, about 15 minutes uh, on the way to their uh, insert point, uh, a couple of uh, MiGs with red stars on their uh, uh, wings and fuselage showed up and chased them out of Cambo or out of Laos and uh, uh, sent them back. And uh, so they aborted the mission, of course. And uh, then the next day they tried it again and uh, it happened again. And we talked to a lot of people since then and that's about the only time uh, we can recall any of the recon teams were um, actually uh, escorted out of one of the, the uh, border country areas uh, by high performance uh, enemy aircraft. Uh, which was kind of a unique situation that uh, they went through. And uh, other than that, uh, it was, uh, you know, for me, pretty uneventful. Uh, things were were relatively calm in, in the Long Bend area. And uh, we were uh, a month away from the Tet Offensive starting. And of course, that changed everything. That was my first experience in combat was defending the perimeter of the uh, 195th area during Tet. And uh, we had a, a quite a um, uh, situation where I guess it would just fate, luck, the hand of Providence, you know, whatever you want to say, but um, be, because General uh, uh, Whalen uh, didn't didn't believe that there were the uh, uh, North Vietnamese were going to honor the truth, and the recon teams had spotted so much activity, he called a lot of the the uh, Arvin forces and canceled their leaves, and. Uh, set up ambushes for him. And uh, if he hadn't, why Saigon and, and uh, the Long Bend, Benoit area would have had uh, disastrous results like some of the other parts of Vietnam. But because of his foresight and uh, planning and, and preparedness, um, we uh, didn't uh, have to experience that. And our uh, Gun teams were called back from uh, Song Bay, and uh, about three in the morning, uh, we were in a firefight on the perimeter. And just to the north of us was a big open field where they uh, uh, engineers had cleared the jungle, so there were fields of fire. They caught about a uh, a force of uh, about four hundred NBA and BC soldiers that were gonna attack from the north and, and overrun us. And uh, they didn't make it across the open area. The Thunder Chickens pretty much dispatched them all. Uh, 
got sidetracked from Christmas, but, uh, you know, it was, uh, it led into it. And, uh, you know, Christmas was uh, a peaceful time actually for us. Um, but uh, boy, things changed after that. We had heard before Christmas an announcement by the, um, the president uh, that we were going to have a ceasefire uh, in Vietnam on uh, December 25th. That announcement was made every year that, uh, you know, we were going to take a break. Uh, we were not going to shoot at each other and everybody could just have a, a one day you know, holiday. Uh, experience has shown that the uh, North Vietnamese tended to violate that every year. They also tended to use that time of the ceasefire uh, to really ramp up moving supplies, equipment, and people uh, down the Ho Chi Minh uh, Highway. So in SOG, we were kind of waiting to be told, uh, actually, you guys are not covered by this ceasefire um, because we want to stop what's coming down you know, the trails. So uh, on the 21st, my team was called in and said, we have a mission for you and we're going to send you out. And you know what you're supposed to do is stop everything coming down the trail in this particular area of operation. So uh, we went out on the 23rd, actually launched, went out, uh, went to the trail, found the trail, started interdicting um, supplies and equipment and things coming down that trail. And on the 25th, uh, we had taken a break and there was a big tree and I don't still don't know what you call the trees, but uh, it's a tree that has, it looks like almost like rocket fins coming out from it at the bottom. And it's part of the root system going up and you know, they're an uh, inch and a half or so thick. Uh, we had taken a break and I just kind of sat back in between two of those big fins on this tree. And I was laying back and I heard a toe popper go off and immediately following the toe popper going off, just a barrage of AK fire coming. Three AK rounds came through the fin on my left side, tore my shirt as it went across, went out the fin on the other side. And the best I can tell, I had just exhaled when the bullets came across. If I had inhaled, they would have taken the top of my chest off. So that was kind of how Christmas, you know, really got off to a bang with me. Uh, so we were, we were in a pretty uh, heavy firefight from there and we had to gradually work our way back down, you know, the ridge back to uh, an extraction LZ where we could get out. Um, we had to, you know, a lot of gunships, um, A1E Sky Raiders, um, put in a lot of napalm, but eventually I uh, got out, got back into uh, FUBA, FOB1, uh, a little before dark and they had saved our Christmas dinner for us. So, you know, it had been setting out for a while, but it was still warm. We got to eat it and no one was shooting at us while, while we were eating it. So that was, uh, that was pretty cool. They took care of us. And, um, you know, so that was Christmas at FOB1. And, you know, shortly, right after that, we were all relocated mostly down to uh, CCN. So, but yeah, that Christmas kind of sticks out. It was, uh, it was pretty exciting. I haven't had that many people shoot at me on Christmas uh, since then. I had, <laughs> I had to get to the other side of the tree in order to have something that was going to protect me because it was obvious those roots were not going to. So um, it really charged me full of adrenaline and cortisol. So as I jumped over the route to get to the behind, to get behind the other tree, I grabbed my you know, rucksack, which was, since I had the radio and everything else was, a, was about 75, 80 pounds. I grabbed it with my left hand and I'm, I'm right-handed. 
I grabbed it and took it with me as I went over to the other side of the tree. And I remember thinking, this thing feels like a pillow or something. It's not heavy at all. And I'm thinking, you know, did I just dump everything out? What, what happened to all the weight that was in this thing? I, I didn't realize at the time, you know, how much strength I had gotten from the adrenaline and cortisol. But when I got back, I, then I discovered I had pulled muscles in my shoulder. I had, I had done all kinds of damage, you know, because I had all the super strength there, but the muscles were, you know, really not strong enough to, to do that. So a lot of interesting things happen. Um, and then, you know, that was also the day when we, we got just to the LZ um, and we'd been battling. We had to make a run for the chopper, but we had to go down kind of a steep bank. And I slipped as I was going down in the mud and I went sliding down. And a, an elephant had just recently been by there and left a large deposit. And I just slid right into it as I went to the LZ. <laughs> And, you know, we got on the, we got on the helicopter and I can see everybody looking around like, what is that? You know, <laughs> what do we smell? And, you know, I had it all over my, my boots and my pants, but, but we got out. So 